One thing that I've learned about wisdom in my own life is that sometimes you can uh, listen to wisdom, sometimes you can uh, see wisdom, and sometimes wisdom is offered to you. But the thing about wisdom is that it is useless unless you take the wisdom and you actually apply it into your own life. And the way that we acknowledge or we use that wisdom is if we understand, or when we trust the wisdom, is if we know where it's coming from. And so I'm going to be reading my key message or my key verse, I guess you could say, from for today is going to be written in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 to 6. So if you have your Bibles with you, you can open up to Proverbs chapter 3, 5, 6. Um, maybe someone already preached on this passage, so maybe it'll be a refresher for all of you, but uh, maybe there'll be something new. Um, and I pray that, you know, whatever I say here today, uh, it'll touch our hearts and, and speak to us. So Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 to 6, it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. In all your ways, acknowledge him. You know, when I read this passage, especially when I read and I, the words acknowledge him, I think to myself, when you acknowledge someone, it means that you know them. You're not going to acknowledge someone that you do not know. And so to be able to acknowledge God and to trust him, we have to be able to know him. If you do not know him, uh, you, we need to seek him and to understand him. And we need to understand what his power is, what his wisdom is, his goodness. And as we begin to understand who he is and in acknowledging him, then we'll be able to trust him more and more. Then we'll be able to seek his presence, to seek his counsel, and to seek his guidance and his direction. Um, but here in this passage, it says that we don't just come to him in only our greatest time of need. And here in this passage, it says that we need to acknowledge him in all of our ways. So every single day. But many times it's not necessarily the case in our lives. I know in my life, sometimes, you know, we've kind of put God to the side, especially when it comes to small matters in our lives. But God wants us to acknowledge him in all, all of our ways every single day, from the greatest to the smallest. You know, I did a little bit of research. I'm a research guy. I like to do research. I like information. Probably way too much. You can talk to my wife. She'll tell me that I don't stop talking to someone with information and the data that I pull up sometimes. Uh, but fortunately, I made a profession out of it um, in, my, in, my, in my work. But... Um, one of the things that I found which is very interesting is that uh, I looked up how many decisions do we make every single day. Think of a number in your mind, and it's probably more than that. Uh, what I found, and I was really shocked by this number, but it says that we make about 30,000 decisions every single day. I don't know about you, but I was shocked by that amount. And so, but when I got to thinking about it uh, for a moment, I realized that uh, when it comes to decisions, the moment that alarm clock goes off in the morning, which hopefully you guys had an alarm clock this morning. I woke up before my alarm clock because I'm still on East Coast time, but that's okay. But you make a decision. Do you snooze the button? How many times are you going to snooze the button? Are you going to get up? Are you going to make breakfast for yourself? Are you going to make breakfast for your kids or just for yourself? But, um, or are you going to get up? Are you going to read the Word of God? Are you going to have coffee? Are you going to be coming to church this morning? Which I see many of you made the decision to be here at church, so... Good for you. That's good. That's good stuff. Um, and so we make all these decisions, decisions after decisions. And the thing is, the decisions can vary from the smallest thing, but also from the largest thing. But the reality is that a lot of decisions that we make in our mind are on a subconscious level. And that subconscious decisions that we make in our lives is basically been programmed by the habits that we have formed in our lives. And while we form these habits in our lives, we subconsciously begin to make decisions. We don't even think about them. There are decisions that you're making right now, whether to listen to me or to not, uh, whether to check your phone and the message that just came in on your phone. We're constantly making decisions, 30,000 decisions, and each of them, from the smallest to the largest, begin to direct the path that we are on. And even the smallest of decisions, when you begin to combine them and they begin to actually uh, uh, direct our path in the direction that we're going with it. And, you know, when it comes to the decisions, the greatest place to look at the type of decisions people have made through their lives is the Bible, obviously. And when we read through the Word of God, there's a lot of stories. There's a lot of people who've made a lot of decisions, a lot of good decisions, a lot of bad decisions. Uh, but the passage or the story that I want to focus in on today of someone who made a lot of good decisions, but also some not-so-great decisions, and that is King David. Um, and I want to just kind of set the, set kind of the, um, set the stage a little bit about David. I mean, some of us are believers here, but I also know that sometimes people come into church, they don't know who King David is, maybe. And so for those who do not know David or King David, as we refer to him, was not a king always. He wasn't born as a king. He, uh, he was just a shepherd boy at one point. But what thing you may have heard is that at one point, King David uh, faced a giant, Goliath. 
And by the power of God, he was able to bring down that giant and destroy him by the word of God, but also with the pebble that, um, that, guided, that God guided into the head of Goliath, and he died. Um, but one thing that I want to focus on with David is that um, his troubles or his tribulations, his challenges in life started from the very beginning, but they really took on a new form after he uh, took down Goliath. And we know that when he killed Goliath, that his fame began to spread throughout the lands. But unfortunately, as his fame continued to grow, so did the jealousy of Saul towards David. And because of that, Saul began to hate David, and he seeked out to kill him, even though he did a great thing. And he saved his army, and he saved the kingdom, he saved the Israelites. He began to pursue him. And as he was pursuing him, David became a refugee. Not a refugee. What's the word I'm looking for? It's not a refugee, a he was exiled. I can't remember the word. I had the word, but anyway. So he went on the run, right? A fugitive. That's what I was looking for. He became a fugitive on the run. And so while he was running, Saul was pursuing him. And there were many moments in David's life where he had to seek the counsel of the Lord to understand what he needed to do, what decision he needed to make. And so um, from the moment he began to run from Saul, um, he was faced with a lot of decisions, as I've mentioned. I'm going to be reading kind of, I won't be reading, but I'll be kind of paraphrasing a lot of passages, but I'll go, be going from 1 Samuel and then going all the way through 2 Samuel. But starting from 1 Samuel chapter 23, verse 1 to 3. So one of the things that we know about David is that he was a man after God's heart. But David was also a person who loved his people. He loved the Israelites. And unfortunately, Saul, where he should have been taking care of his people, the Israelites, instead he was pursuing David during that time. But David, even in the midst of his running away from Saul, he was able to help out his people. And there was one such event in his life, which we read about in 1 Samuel chapter 23, verse 1 to 3. We read about when there's these people in the city of Keilah, I believe that's how it's pronounced, were ambushed by the Philistines. So they, these people, these Israelites, were ambushed by the Philistines. So you would think that the king of Israel, what he would do, in that case was Saul, would pursue and help out the city, but he does not. But David hears about it, even though he's hiding away somewhere in a cave uh, from uh, Saul, he hears of this, and so what does he decide to do? He loves his people, but before he does anything, he does something that we should all do before we make any big decision or small decision in our own life. It says he sought out the counsel of God. He wanted to make sure that if he pursued and he goes, saves these people from the ambush of the Philistines, that God would protect him, that God would provide for him, that God would give him victory. And most importantly, he knew that the decision he would make would not only affect his life, but also the lives of the men that were with him. And so he wanted to make sure that God would give him victory. And so he went to God, and God says that indeed you will be able to overtake these Philistines. So he gets confirmation to God that this is a good decision. This is a great step for you to take. But unfortunately, his men, you have to realize that these men that were with David, and I forgot to kind of mention, is that these are also kind of, I guess you could say, people who were on the run, people who were discouraged, the men that were with David. They were all in a place in their life, and they joined David for similar reasons to what, that he was running away from Saul as well. So he had this group of men, and so they were discouraged. And so they were afraid as well, even though they got confirmation from God saying, God said, go ahead and pursue them. Uh, but they were still afraid. So then he goes again, he asks God, Will you give us victory? And God once again affirmed that they would be victorious. And so they go to the city of Keilah, uh, and they save the city. So after saving the city, um, and once again, you'll see that it's like one thing after another, just like in our lives, you know? We have decision after decision. But for me, it seems like these are these big decisions in David's life, but he's always seeking the Lord. And so in this case, so he saves these people, right? So you would feel that they would be grateful. You would be grateful if someone came into your city, here the city of Vancouver, and saved us from some sort of invasion or from some uh, sort of evil. And so he saves these people, but then he hears that Saul heard as well of what he has done. And so what does he do? He once again goes to the Lord so that the Lord can direct his path and his decision of what he should do. So he goes before the Lord in 1 Samuel 23, 10 to 14, we read that, um, after he delivers them, after the, he delivers the city of Keilah from the Philistines, he inquires of God, will Saul come after me? Will Saul come after me, and will the people deliver me from his hand? And so God says, yes, Saul will come after you, and these people will deliver you into his hands. So these same people that he just saved, rather than leaning in and just thinking to himself, I just saved these people, they're going to protect me. 
They're going to provide for me. They're going to have my back. But instead, what happens is God says that they will turn you in. And the thing is, we don't know what the reason is behind these people. One of the reasons that these people may have turned him in is because they were afraid of Saul. They know what Saul is capable of, right? So it's not that they were evil people, but he couldn't, uh, but we just don't know the reasoning behind them. And that's the same thing with our lives as well. Sometimes we help people out, but sometimes people act in a way that maybe are surprising to us. And so God says to them, he says to them that you need to go on the run. So he didn't place his loyalty into these people because he doesn't know what's going on. He doesn't know what their motives are. He doesn't know what they're facing with or what they're dealing with. And so he goes and he counsels with the Lord and the Lord tells him to leave. And it's also just another reminder for us as well not to be so quick to trust others. Yes, we're supposed to be trusting and we're supposed to bear one another's burdens as believers, but when it comes to the rest of this world, we should always seek counsel from God in every decision that we make in our lives, from the smallest to the greatest of decisions, because we do not know that the state that the person is in, that maybe we're even trying to help or that we have helped. We do not know where they are currently in their lives. That's why it's important for us to seek God, because God knows what's inside each and every one of us. He knows what directs us. He knows what motivates us, and he knows why, the peop- why people make the decisions that they make. Um, and so a short time passed by, actually not a short time, a decent amount of time passes by after he saves the people of Keilah, and then Saul does come. But then there are two moments in his life where he has the opportunity to actually kill, to get rid of his problem, which was Saul, who was pursuing him. We read that two times he had an opportunity to kill him, but twice he spared the life of Saul, which also says a lot about the personality and the character of King David. But then a moment comes in 1 Samuel, jumping ahead all the way to chapter 30, verse 8 to 9, where David is kind of going about from city to city, doing his thing, running from Saul, but also supporting and helping the Israelites because Saul wasn't doing his job very well. And so after going on this journey with his men, they come back to the city called uh, Ziklag. And you can read this in 1 Samuel 30, verse 8 to 9, where they return from Ziklag with his 600 men. And what does he notice? They're exhausted. They're tired. And they come into the city, and they see it burnt down. They see the city burnt down, and they see that their people are nowhere to be found. Their families are gone. Loved ones are missing. And so what does David do? What would you do if you were in David's shoes? Would you get angry? Would you get bitter? You just saved all these people. You've done all this work for the Lord, and you come back only for your own place to be burnt down and for your family to be missing. You could get bitter. You could get angry. You could get frustrated with God. But instead, David says, does something very, very unique because he knows who God is, because he trusts him. He does the same thing that he has always done before. It says, David inquired of the Lord if they should pursue the Amalekites. And God says to him, pursue them. And God says something also interesting. He just asked God if God will give them into his hands. But God says something interesting as well. Remember, David just came back. He's in a really bad place. Put yourself into, your, into his shoes. He's in a really bad place. And when he asked God if he'll overtake, if he'll give them into his hands, God says to him, not only will you overtake them, he's like, but you will recover everything. You will recover all Can you imagine how David felt in that moment? Because the thing is, he knows that God may give him victory, but he doesn't know if his family is alive. He doesn't know how many people are going to be dead or what's going to happen, what has happened to them when he finds them. But here God says that you will recover all. God speaks hope into his heart. His response gives him hope. This dark and gray, very important type of weather day for him turns into sunshine, turns into hope. All because he went into the presence of the Lord. And many times in our own lives, when we are discouraged, when we are down, all we have to do is just go into the presence of the Lord. And when we go into the presence of the Lord, he speaks truth into our hearts. He speaks peace into our hearts. He speaks love into our hearts. And it encourages us and helps us to keep moving forward. And it helps us to continue to trust him. And so that's what he does. So this moment of this black cloud of sorrow in his life was replaced with joy and great hope all because he went into the presence of the Lord and he acknowledged him for who he was, the power that he had to turn things around. And so after that, he pursues them and he gets everything back and then some. So then time goes by again and then he once again goes to the Lord because he finds out some news. He finds out that King Saul is dead. And he also finds out at the same time that his friend Jonathan is dead as well. 
So some bittersweet news, but you would think that David, after being pursued by Saul for so long, he would rush to the capital or rush to his people and take the throne, grab that crown out of his, from his head and put it on himself. But that is not the way that David responds. Instead, you know what David does? He mourns for God's anointed one. He mourns for him and he mourns for Jonathan. But then he goes before the Lord, as he did before, and he says to God, should I go to Hebron? Should I go back to my people? And God says to him, go up to Hebron. And there he was anointed king because he was patient and he waited for the Lord, for the Lord's perfect and right timing. How many times do we lose opportunities in our own lives when we rush to take that which we think is ours, but God has not prepared it for us just yet? But David waited because he knew that the Lord knew the perfect timing, and he trusted in the Lord, and he acknowledged all his ways in him. So then David goes, and he is anointed to be king, right? And so now he has a lot more resources. He has deeper pockets. He has prosperity. He has power. He has his people behind him. But unfortunately, his troubles don't disappear. We read in in 2 Samuel Chapter 5, verse 17 to 21, we read that the enemies continue to pursue him. Despite all that he has gained, they continue to pursue him. And what does he do? He says, I have the might. I have the power now. I have an army. I have resources. I have prosperity. I will use that to defeat my enemy. But that's not what David does because he realizes that this prosperity and that which has been given him has been given to him only by the Lord and by the Lord alone. So what does he do? He says, we read that he once again would inquire of the Lord to fight or not. Because he knew that, once again, it wasn't just his life on the line, it was the life of his people. And he was the type of person who would do whatever he can to spare the lives of his people if he could. Only if God granted him victory would he pursue the enemy. And God did. God told him that he would give him the, give him the victory, so he pursued the enemy, and he defeated them. You know, and this is a really important reminder to us all. We've all been in moments in our lives where We have a lot of questions. We're down. We're discouraged. Maybe we're low on money. Maybe we don't have a job. Maybe we don't have a place to call home. But when God gives us that which we've been praying for, prosperity, hope, love, relationship, when he begins to give us those things, how do we respond to those blessings that God gives us? Do we begin to depend on those things or do we continue to depend on God? Here, what King David does, it shows us a great example of continuing to depend on God despite the prosperity and the newfound power that he just received. He continues to lean on God, not on the prosperity that was given to him and the power that was given to him as becoming anointed as king. But the Philistines weren't done. The Philistines, just like the enemy in our own lives, he doesn't give up. He doesn't just attack us from time to time. He continues to pursue us day in and day in. It says that he is like a roaring lion, seeking to kill and to devour, to destroy. In the same way, this is an example of what the Philistines were doing too, seeking to destroy him. And so what happens? A very similar situation happens once again. After his first victory of king, we've continued reading in 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 22 to 25, it says that the Philistines came after him again. And once again, what does he do? He inquires of the Lord what to do if she could go up against them. He sought God's guidance once again. So this is very interesting because the situation is actually quite the same. If you think about it, the situation is very, very similar because it's the same Philistines, it's kind of the same scenario, and he's deciding what he should do here. We have the same thing happen in our lives as well. Sometimes like we uh, struggle with something and then God gives us victory over it and they're like, we figured it out. We know the template for how to do it. We figured it out. And so then when a scenario comes up that's very similar, we're like, God, stand back. I'm going to do this. I have the template. You gave me the template. Now I'm going to do it by myself. And then you go out there and you use the template. It does not work. It doesn't fit into the template. Like, God, I did what it, you told me to do last time, and it just didn't work out. And God's saying, no, no, no. It was never the template. It was always me. It was always me. And we forget that. When we think we just got things figured out, things change once again. And so what does David do here? David goes up and he once again seeks guidance from God. Even though the circumstances were the same, the situation was still the same, he realized that each of these victories that he has had in his life, from the bear, from the lion, from Goliath, from the Philistines, from all these that he has faced, all the enemy, he knew that it was from the Lord and from the Lord alone. 
and he gave him the glory for that. And so he seeked his counsel once again. And you know what the interesting thing is in this particular situation? God does not tell him to go. God says the opposite. Before he said, go up, but this time he said, you shall not go up. So a very different answer, right? Now imagine if he went up, what would have happened? A completely different story, but he decides to wait because the Lord says to him, he's like, I will go before you. I'm going to go first. I'm going to prepare the way. And then after I have prepared the way and I have done my work, then you will go and you will destroy the Philistines. So David had to wait, but his waiting was rewarded. You know, many times we rush into things. We get excited, even for the Lord, to serve the Lord. We get so excited sometimes. God gives us a vision for what we want to do. And we get so excited about it. We want to do it and want to get everyone behind us. But many times what happens is that God still needs to prepare the way. He still needs to open up the doors. He still needs to get people right. Sometimes we want to go even preach the word of God to certain people. But what God needs us to do first is to pray for those people so that he can prepare their hearts. And so that way when we go and we speak to them, that the Holy Spirit may do the work because it is not us. Just as David recognized that it was always God who did the work in his life, we have to realize and understand that it is God who does the work in our lives as well. And give him the glory for that and seek his counsel and acknowledge all our ways to him because it is only him alone and not us. And so he goes and he waits and then God gives him victory. You know, there were many other inquiries from the Lord that David went. There was famines in the land and he inquired of the Lord of why the famine was in the land. And there were many other circumstances, but he continued to trust the Lord. Despite what was going on around him, he continued to trust the Lord. But imagine if David did not seek the counsel of the Lord. In all those situations that we just went through, I know there are a lot of them, but I'm getting to a point here. Imagine if he did not seek God's counsel in all these circumstances. How would his life change? <laughs> how would have his life change? And how would the life change of the people that were following him? It would have been a completely different situation for him. Imagine what his life would have been. Would he have become king? Would have people continued to see him as the man after God's heart if he did not seek God's counsel always? We know that all these steps and all the times that he seek the Lord, it was because it paved the path to his future success as king. Because of God. It was always because of God. We already read, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. When is the last time we truly acknowledged God in our path? I mean, really, really acknowledged him from the smallest decision, from the biggest decision. How often do you come before the Lord like David did and ask him, God, is this where you want me to go? Is this what you want me to do? Is this who you want me to talk to? When is the last time we really seek God's counsel in the decision in our lives? You know, like David was on the run from the Saul, we were, we're also living on certain times, very uncertain times. There's so much chaos going in the world right now. And we may not have a king person pursuing you, at least I don't. Um, but the pressure of the trials we face are just as real. But sometimes maybe they're on a smaller scale, but sometimes they feel just as heavy. But the decisions we made, just like in David's life, the decisions that he made and the decisions that we make, it directs us, it puts us on a path, either on the path of destruction or on the path of righteousness towards the Lord. And right now, we all live in a time, many of us are in different seasons of our lives. I see youth here, I see kids here, I see elderly here, and we're all in different seasons in our lives. But we're all influenced by the world and by the people around us, especially when there's chaos all around us. Some of you here who are in youth, maybe you, you just got married or you're thinking of getting married and you're thinking to yourself, should I start a family? What do you guys think? That's a pretty big decision to make in life, right? Should I start a family? Despite what's going on in the world, despite how chaotic everything is, should I start a family? That's a question you need to take to the Lord. That is not a question you should deal with yourself. It's not a question you should resolve on your own. How about, should I leave my kids in public school? That's a question that's on a lot of people's mind. With everything that's going on in the world right now and in the education system, you ask yourself the question, should I leave my kids in school? Should I homeschool them? Do I have the resources to homeschool them? Do I have the time to homeschool them? Or should I take them to private school? How much is it going to cost? Like, all these questions come up. Or right now, especially those young couples who are getting married right now, and you see your friends getting, buying homes and 
you know, you want a home yourself too, but then you look at the interest rate and you think that there's a mistake with it, and you're thinking maybe someone made a mistake somewhere. But the reality is that many of us want to be like everyone else, and we want to have a house, and there's nothing wrong with wanting a house or a home. But you have to ask yourself the question, it's like, can I afford it? Taking that question to the Lord, because if God wants what's best for you, he wants what's best for you, but unfortunately, many times, it's not on our time, and maybe it's not the perfect timing. But if we wait upon the Lord, he will give us the desires of our heart, if it's according to his will. Or how about even selling the house, too? It's like there's people who are buying, but then there's people who are selling the house. Should I sell my home right now? But what am I going to live in if I sell this house? Are there any homes out there? There's just so many decisions and decisions upon decisions. You make one decision, it gives birth to like 20 decisions. And it can be overwhelming, so we bring it to the Lord. Or maybe even moving away from this crazy world we call Oregon and Washington. Should I move to Florida? Should I move to a different state? We ask that question as well. Do we need to get away from it? Or is this where God has planted us and this is where God wants us to serve? We need to bring those questions to the Lord. We live in a time of uncertainty and it can be very difficult to understand what to do. And when we see other people scrambling, this is the biggest thing that influences us. We sometimes look at other people around and we see them scrambling. We see them making decisions. We see them being anxious. And it makes us anxious and it makes us to start making decisions as well. But God is never anxious. God is never worried. God is not influenced by this world. He is the best person to go to when it comes to these type of decisions in our own life. So what do we do? Do we lean our own, on our own understanding? Or do we lean on the understanding and do we trust on God? You know, the word trust in this verse has a very interesting meaning. One of the meanings that I found, I looked it up, is that uh, it means to lie helpless face down. To lie helpless face down. Such an interesting meaning for the word trust, isn't it? I don't know if you guys have ever been there, but I've been there before. Lying face down, just like helpless, saying, God, I don't know what to do. Help me, Lord. I've been there. I've been there plenty of times. But it's a good place to be. You know why? Because we're in a place of submission to the Lord. And when we are in a place of submission to the Lord and we trust him, that's the best place you can do because that's when we start making good decisions because the decisions that the Lord is making for us rather than us making our decisions ourselves, lying helpless. And I imagine David, can you imagine how many times David spent in this position, helpless, face down before the Lord? If you read through Psalms, how many times he went into the temple of the Lord to be with him. In the middle of the night, he would wake up and he would be with the Lord face down. And he was forced to do that because of the circumstances in his life. His friends, uh, his enemies, his circumstances forced him to be face down and to trust the Lord. But when we do this, when we decide to put our trust in the Lord, when we decide not to trust in our understanding, when we decide to acknowledge and honor God in all that we do, when we do those things, God begins to direct our path. And you know, there's another thing that interestingly happens as well. Something very interesting happens when we begin to seek the Lord. The things that are around us, the storms, the people, the anxiety, the fear, all those things begin to affect us less and less because we see and we focus on the Lord and the storm. When we trust God, he guides us. But when we begin to trust other things, it leads us in the opposite direction. Now, there was one person, uh, a very well-known commentator, Don Trapp, he said the following. He said that he, uh, he that stands with one foot on a rock and another foot upon quicksand will sink and perish as certainly as he that stands with both feet on quicksand. Isn't that interesting? We think that we're safe if we have some sort of firm ground by one leg into a quicksand, but we will sink nonetheless. Same thing in our lives as well. The Bible tells us that we can't have one foot in the world and one foot in, in, in God. We can't. We're either 100% committed to it or we're not. Because the moment you step away from God, you step into the hurricane. You step out of the eye of the storm into the chaos. We start taking shortcuts. And let me tell you, those shortcuts give a, get us even a lot more lost. Um, David knew better than anybody, as we've already mentioned, that with every question, with every decision that he needed to make, he needed to acquire of the Lord of what to do. And he did that consistently, but that wasn't always the case. When David first went on uh, the run from Saul, when he started running from Saul in the first place, one of the things that he decides to do is he goes to the city of Nob. And when he goes to the city of Nob, he is meted by the priest uh, Ahimelech. And Ahimelech, sorry, Ahimelech, uh, he meets them there. And at first he's afraid when David comes there. And he says to David, he's like, what, what are you doing here? 
Like, why are you here? And then he responds to him. He says to him, he's like, oh, he decides to cover up, not tell him the truth. And he says, oh, I'm on the king's business. And we don't know why David did that. It's possible that he was just trying to uh, protect maybe Ahimelech. Uh, so that way he wouldn't know and he wouldn't feel like he's betraying Saul. Or maybe he was trying to protect himself or his people. We don't know exactly why he said that. But one thing that we do know is that here, when you read in this passage, he did not go to the Lord. He did not inquire of the Lord of what he should do. He did not get wisdom from God of what he should do in this situation. So what happens? What happens because of his lie? Because of his decision? It says that further on, and we read that Ahimelech, by the hand of Saul, well, not by the hand of Saul, Saul commands someone. The de- uh, he brings death to Ahimelech, 85 other men, and others in the city, including women and children. All because he did decided not to inquire of the Lord of what he should do in that situation. Because he didn't inquire of the Lord, all these people's lives were lost. And then he hears about it, and his response is at least a, a good response. He realized when the person comes to him with the news, he says, it is my fault. It is my fault that these people died because he didn't go to the Lord. He didn't trust the Lord. He didn't acknowledge him in this situation. But the cost is great. It was a very, very costly mistake and a very costly lesson for him to learn. I bet you there are people sitting here, including myself, who've had costly mistakes in our own lives when we didn't inquire of the Lord, whether it's with jobs, relationships, in our prayer life, with school, um, with going hanging out with a certain group of people. Every single one of us has made mistakes in our lives. Otherwise, we wouldn't need the blood of Jesus to wash us. We've all made mistakes, and many times those lessons were very, very costly. Maybe it cost us, or maybe it cost those around us. And that's all because we forget, or we don't go into the counsel of the Lord, and we don't seek his counsel. Um, now, we don't need to wait for the storms or these costly mistakes to come to God. We don't need to wait for these hard lessons. We have the word of God, which is full of really bad decisions and really great reminders of what not to do. But many times we do not take that wisdom. We see it, we hear it, we understand it, but we don't apply it to our own lives. And I'm included in that as well. And because of that, we have these costly mistakes. And unfortunately, many times it leads us into sin because we start to take shortcuts in our lives. Don't wait for those storms in your lives. Don't wait for those mistakes to realize that you need to lean on the Lord and not your own understanding. Don't wait for those moments. Don't allow the decisions or others, maybe anxieties or fears to influence your decisions. Lean on the Lord. Um, I'm finishing up here, and I wanted to leave the story just because I think it's such a great illustration of what it means to not just believe in God, but to trust God. Uh, Charles Blondin um, was, uh, in 1855, Charles Blondin was an acrobat and a tightrope walker. You guys probably know what that is. Um, it's very popular, tightroping in, in Portland especially. You see him everywhere. It seems like every other tree has a tightrope walker. But anyways, um, but he claimed that he could walk uh, from one side of the Niagara Falls to the other on, one, on a rope with no netting supporting him. And so he invites, a crowd came out and paid to watch him. It's, crazy what people pay to watch these days for someone to do something so dangerous but so people came and 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 paid to watch but before crossing he asked the crowd he says these do you believe i can walk across the other side and the crowd yes we believe he says do you believe i can cross with a man on my back and they yell we believe and so then he says so who will volunteer (laughs) it's a complete silence Nobody wants to volunteer. It's like just sitting there. We believe, but no one wants to volunteer. But then all of a sudden, a hand in the back goes up, and he says, I, I believe. I believe. And so this man comes over, climbs on his man, on, on, uh, on uh, Charles' back, and they walk across in the rope to the other side of Niagara Falls. Now, this was a planted person, but still a person who trusted him. This was Blondin's manager. I believe his name was uh, Harry uh, Colcord. He knew who he was, he knew what he was capable of, and so not only did he believe that he can do it, he trusted him, and he trusted him enough to get on his back. Isn't that a great illustration of our own uh, relationship with God? Many times we say, we believe, God, I believe. I believe, and then God says, come on, let's get on. And then we just sit back and we wait. What are we waiting for? 
How many times has he pulled us out of the pit? How many times has he answered our prayers? How many times have we tr put our trust in him and he has been faithful to us despite our own unfaithfulness? Many times, time and time again. We not only need to believe, we need to trust. And I'll leave us with this. Many of us sitting here today, we've not only believed, but we've put our trust in him. When we come out and we say, God, I am a sinner. I cannot do this. All the decisions that I've been making in my lives have been wrong, but you can make the right decisions in my own life. You can help me. You can guide me. I'm lost without you. We put our trust in him. But many times, that's where our trust ends. And we don't continue. But God wants us to continue to walk with him, to submit to him in all our ways, to trust him completely and wholeheartedly, just like that man did when he climbed on the back of his friend. You know, we're going to pray right now, and I want to invite anyone here today who has maybe never taken that first step in their trust. Maybe you've never, maybe you've just believed, but you've never trusted him, and you've never put your faith in Christ. You can do that at any time. That's the great thing about salvation, about our faith, and about grace, is that we can come to Christ any time. If the Holy Spirit is, but it's important to do it when the Holy Spirit is moving your heart, because it's the Holy Spirit that moves our hearts to come to Christ. We don't just make the decision. It needs to be moved by the Holy Spirit. It can't be emotion. It has to be by the Spirit. And maybe there are some of us here who have maybe started taking some shortcuts in your lives. I'm here to tell you that I've taken shortcuts in my life, but by God's grace and by God's mercy, he has helped me get back on the right path and to trust him in our decisions. And so as we stand here today, I will say that you know, this is a great reminder when we take part in communion, one of the things that we're doing is we're acknowledging Christ for who he is. We're acknowledging Christ for what he did on the cross. We're acknowledging him that he is the son of God. We're acknowledging that he bled his blood for us on the cross and that he rose from the dead again. That is what we acknowledge today when we take part in communion. And we get to do that together. So I pray to those maybe who are lost or who maybe have been taking some shortcuts in their lives to get on the right path Make your way right with the Lord because he is coming soon. And if you have never taken that step to make that, don't delay. It says that the, the day of salvation is today because if the Holy Spirit is moving your heart today to come to him, then today is the day for you to come to Christ. Do not delay in that. And may God bless you all as we take part in communion today. Amen.